Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our GST litigation series. Today we have with us the most eminent faculty, um, at Dr. Advocate CA Avinash Poddar for uh, covering up and helping us gain some knowledge on the fake invoicing and arrest under the GST law. Let me have a quick introduction. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Advocate CA Avinash. Let me have a quick introduction. And um, so he is a currently a practicing as an advocate in the field of indirect taxes, commercial laws and cybercrime, having more than 21 years of experience. Since 17 years, he has had an experience as a practicing C and now as an advocate. He is regularly appearing and arguing before the Honorable Supreme Court, various high courts, special courts and tribunals. He's based at, based at Ahmedabad, Surat and Delhi and have branches and associates all over India. He's associated with Messrs. Ashwa Legal Advisors, LLP, attorneys and advocates as a founder partner and with Messrs. AAP and Company, Chartered Accountants as legal advisor. He is the author of various books on GST and indirect taxes. Having completed his BCom and LLB, he has also completed his FCA, LLM, PhD in GST, um, PG, CCL, DISA, CFP, MCP, and various other certificate certified courses of ICI. He has a varied professional experience and has completed the Chartered Accountancy exam in 2000 with excellent re academic record and also a merit list rank. He specializes in the field of indirect taxation, corporate laws, RERA, IBC, and cybercrime, and also appears and argues before the Honorable Supreme Court of India and various other high courts and sessions court. The contribution as a professional to trade and profession by our eminent faculty has nearly been noteworthy in various uh, entanglements. And he's also delivered more than 900 lectures all over India at various residential, regional, and national conferences organized by ICI, ICSI, ICWI, ICEI, and so on. The contribution as an author for of uh, Dr. Advocate C.A. Podar, Avinash Podarji has been eminent and he has written various books, recently co-authored Audit and Annual Return in GST, Appeals and Litigation in GST, co-authored various other GST books, service tax related books, and also motivational books. He has been recognized as the winner of the prestigious DIOL Award 2021 and so on and so forth. We are very happy to have you, sir, here today for delivering this prestigious lecture. And uh, I now request you, sir, to take on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dhoni ji. I hope I'm audible. I can see on my screen. Secretary WRC Shweta ji. Thank you, sir, for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a proud privilege for me. And at the outset, I would like to thank WRC for giving me this opportunity of sharing my views. And also would like to tender an apology that this session was scheduled earlier, but this could not be done because of the some uh, unavoidable circumstances with my fellow speaker. I think he, he is going to take this second session today. Now, first and foremost, the litigation, GST litigation series. As I have already stated, this is something which is the need of the hour. And therefore, the endeavor of the WRC for conducting such kind of series is really appreciable. Topic which is given to me is a very subjective topic. It, it cannot be dealt with in a limited frame of time or there cannot be a, like we can say, we, we cannot have a standard discussion on the allotted topic. The reason being, it may differ or the conclusion or rather the understanding of the law and the 
treatment may differ on the basis of the facts of each of the case. Tapa PPT fail. No PPT, no. Okay. So therefore, the the issue which I would like to endeavor today and deal with would more or less be overall discussion so far as this topic is concerned because there are two limbs of my topic today. One, it deals with, I will have to rather deal with or deliberate upon the fake invoicing which is really an area of pain for many professionals and not only the professionals but also the trade. And second limb of the topic which is to be deliberated by me would be arrest. Both the topics are absolutely subjective but at the same time very interesting. So let me start with fake invoicing. And to start with this, I would like to first clarify to each one of you my understanding so far as fake invoice is concerned. And then we'll discuss what is happening across the country. And at the same time, we will also try to discuss and understand a circular which is recently issued by the CBIC on the understanding of fake invoices. Rather, they are making us understand that what department or board considers to be fake invoice and how it will be dealt with by the departmental officers. Because circulars are always binding on the departmental officers. There are n number of judgments which support this view that once a circular is issued, it may not be having a binding effect on the taxpayer or the assessee, but it is certainly having a binding effect on the officers. So that also we'll discuss. Now, my understanding so far as the term fake invoice is concerned is an invoice which is issued and which is legally tenable in the eyes of the law can never be a fake invoice because department now and then is alleging a recipient of goods or services that you have procured certain goods or certain services from the supplier who has absconding, who is absconding or who has not paid the tax or whose registration is cancelled CU motu under section 29, subsection 2. These are some of the common allegations. And at the same time, the another allegation which we commonly find is an allegation wherein they allege that, look, Mr. Avinash, you have procured from so and so person. His registration is cancelled CU motu. And therefore, whatever purchases you have shown or whatever credit you have taken on those purchases is not at all a credit which is tenable in law. And therefore, you are supposed to reverse those credits along with interest and penalty. This is what generally they allege. And at the same time, they also allege the circular trading. Now, we'll have to understand this in the given circumstances. I'll try to discuss with few examples so that I can make you understand my understanding of this. I let me first submit very honestly that I am merely a student of law. I am not an expert in this subject. Whatever we are facing in day to day life or the cases that we are dealing in day to day, only on the basis of those experiences, I would like to share my views pertaining to it. Those views may be appreciated by the participants, or there are fair chances that the views may not be appreciated. But I usually carry and understand that we professionals must have a view that is important. View may be correct, it may be incorrect. That certainly may not be that important. But important is that we must have a view so that we can advise our clients accordingly. So my view is any invoice which is issued by a person who is registered under GST and the invoice is issued 
as per the provisions of section 31 read with rule 46 and the contents which are required to be there in the invoice are included in that invoice then that invoice by no stretch of imagination can be said to be a fake invoice this is a bold statement which i am making but as a lawyer as a chartered accountant this is my role and responsibility to share my understanding with the persons who are seeking the advice or who are here to attend the session so therefore this is very clear as per my limited understanding <coughs> a legally tenable issue uh, issuance of an invoice or a, an invoice which is legally tenable and a valid invoice under the provisions of the gst law can never be said to be a fake invoice this is one very very important understanding of mine and a very controversial also so if i believe that an invoice which is issued under gst law as per the provisions therein is a valid invoice and therefore it cannot be said to be a fake invoice then what is fake invoice so friends in that context i would like to submit that my understanding says that fake invoice is an invoice i am repeating fake invoice is that invoice which is issued by a person who is not registered under gst or who was registered but his registration is already cancelled under gst maybe by way of surrendering of gst by him himself or maybe by the departmental proceedings that the registration is cancelled in both the cases the person does not fall into the category of a registered taxable person and therefore all the invoices which he will be issuing after that will be a fake invoice or an invoice which is issued using the gst number of someone else by a third person for example avinash podar is a registered taxable person he has a gst registration number now his registration number is used by mr x and mr x is issuing an invoice in his name using the gst number of avinash poda so therefore this invoice as per my understanding is not a legally tenable invoice and hence it is a fake invoice so to sum up my understanding i would say any invoice issued under gst law within the four corners of the provisions of section 31 read with rule 46 by a taxable person who is registered under the act can never be a fake invoice it can be a fake invoice only when it is issued by someone who is not registered or it is issued without following the provisions of the law and the rules made there under so this is my understanding now <coughs> what are the common questions and allegations that we chartered accountants are facing or rather our clients are facing not we chartered accountant but we are advising them the first and foremost is that you have procured goods as i already stated that you have procured certain goods from mr x and mr x registration number is cancelled retrospectively can it be said to be a fake invoice my limited understanding again says no it can never be said to be a fake invoice rather it is a valid invoice on which the credit which is availed by me and utilized is also a valid input tax credit unless it is proved i am repeating unless it is proved that i had connived with my supplier that is mr x in my example and try to avoid or maybe evade the tax by utilizing input tax credit which otherwise was not eligible so therefore that can be said to be a transaction which is not a valid transaction in law but the invoice issued can never be a fake invoice so again i am insisting on one thing please look into 
the facts and circumstances of the case that if it is issued by a valid person, a legal registered person, and it is having all the contentions and contents as per the provisions under law, then it cannot be said to be a fake invoice. Yes, the input tax credit may be questioned. The input tax credit can certainly be questioned because now let us very quickly try to understand the conditions which are there and why they are saying that the input tax credit needs to be reversed because it's a fake invoice. Friends, we all are understanding this, that GST law was incorporated and implemented so as to avoid, uh, uh, avoid many technical difficulties in the erstwhile regime. And one of the most prominent technical difficulty was the cascading effect of tax. And therefore, the suggestion and the statement of object clearly stated that there has to be a seamless flow of credit. Therefore, it meant that the credit will never or credit chain will never be broken up. And henceforth, there will not be any tax on tax. So ITC is one of the most important, rather the backbone of GST. Section 16 deals with the provisions pertaining to eligibility and entitlement of ITC. Section 16, subsection 1 says, every registered person is entitled to or eligible to avail input tax credit in his electronic credit ledger on input, input services and capital goods, which is used or intended to be used in course or furtherance of business. We all know that. I'll not go into those things. Today, my endeavor would be only to deal with the practical issues, which I believe are important and relevant so far as this topic is concerned. And whatever time is allotted to me, I'll try to conclude by 6.15 so that we have some 15 minutes for discussion and then the other speaker can take over. Then comes section 16, subsection 2. So say, there is a difference between 16.1 and 16.2 as per my understanding. 16.1 says that you will become eligible for claiming input tax credit provided those input input services or capital goods are used or intended to be used in course or furtherance of business. This is what is provided for. That means that gives you eligibility to claim input tax credit or when input tax credit can be claimed. Subsection 2 of section 16 provides the conditions which needs to be satisfied so as to make you entitled. I'm repeating section 16 subsection 2 provides the conditions which are supposed to be satisfied in order to get entitlement of availment of input tax credit. Meaning thereby, until we satisfy, until we comply with the conditions which are specified under section 16, subsection 2, we will not be entitled. We can be eligible for claiming input tax credit. But unless we satisfy, we will not be entitled to claim or rather avail the ITC. Which are those conditions? First condition, you must have an invoice, which we all have. And therefore, we have to harp upon not only that we have the invoice, but also it's a valid invoice issued under the provisions of the law. And in my example, which I have given, that Mr. X has surrendered his registration or his registration was cancelled, Sue Moto. And the department says that you have already an invoice. You already have an invoice on which you have availed the input tax credit, whereas the supplier's registration has already been cancelled. And so the purchases are fake. So please remember, as a legal advisor, our endeavor should be to justify that when the purchases were made or when the services were received, at that point in time, the supplier was duly registered. His registration might have been cancelled retrospectively, but the day on which the supplies were made, he was registered. 
and since he was registered the invoice which you have procured is a valid invoice it is not a fake invoice that will be the first submission because nobody knows tomorrow future is uncertain there can be situations that there there had been situations wherein due to the covid many persons many suppliers of goods and services have closed down their operations and therefore the registrations are surrendered or cancelled so can the department come forward today and say that 2020 mein uska band ho gaya and his registration is cancelled so therefore whatever procurements you have in 17 18 or 18 19 are assumed to be a fake uh, transactions of fake invoice that you have never received the goods or services that cannot be so therefore the first condition is you must have an invoice and your endeavor would be to check the date on which the invoice was issued whether he was registered or not number 1 number 2 though that invoice is duly issued as per the provisions of the law two then they allege the second allegation of the department is that you have never received the goods or services it is merely an invoice that you have procured again i would insist and i would again reiterate friends there can be a circumstance or a situation wherein the goods might have not traveled or the services might not have been received but there can never be a situation wherein the invoice which was issued for those goods which have never traveled can be said to be a fake invoice because the word fake means which is issued by someone who has no authority to issue or no jurisdiction to issue that invoice that is not in our case in our case the example which i am citing to all of you is that i might have not received the goods it is merely an invoice which is sent to me so that can be a transaction which is liable for penalty under section 122 or the itc may be liable for reversal under section 16 subsection 2 clause b the non compliance of conditions but that is not a transaction of fake invoice because now the department every now and then in almost all these situations they have only one mandate prove that goods have not traveled and therefore it is a fake invoice no that cannot be a fake invoice yes we can very well argue upon and the department can allege that you have not received the goods so therefore the second advice would be please bear in mind please bear in mind for complying with section 162b that means the received receipt of goods or services you need to maintain the records which is specified under section 35 red with rules and records have to be maintained very very categorically and very very meticulously because see in most of the cases the reason of losing a matter or losing a case or winning a case the reason the the basis the documents or the records which are being maintained and therefore because those creates the evidences so whenever you are receiving an a goods or a service it has to be duly recorded in your books of accounts because section 35 also specifically provided provides for five kind of books which are mandatory to be maintained and one of these is inward supply of goods or services so therefore please duly maintain those records and accounts which are specified in the law in the proper manner so that when time comes and the allegation on you is there by the departmental officer that you have never received the goods at least you by your records you can show them i had come across lot of such cases lots and lots of sub case, such cases specifically in scrap industry steel industry many cases in, in textile industry diamond industry wherein the allegation is that the person from whom you have procured the invoice or the person who has rather let me put it in this way the person who has issued the invoice is not the person who has supplied the goods specifically in scrap industry what does that say they say avinash you have procured goods 
we are not denying that you have not received the goods what we are contemplating or what we are challenging is that you have received the goods but the invoice which is issued by mr x to you on which you have availed the input tax credit is the invoice which is not supported by the transportation of goods meaning thereby mr x has only issued invoice to you and you have received the goods from someone else this is their prime allegation now how to come out with this allegation now please appreciate the bona fide is very important terminology and it is not necessary that everywhere malafide has to be proved so that come that helps the departmental officer also but at the same time if you are able to maintain your records properly let us take an example of a manufacturer a manufacturer of let's say tmt bar he receives a scrap of steel or something like that as soon as he receives the goods he enters into his records now when those goods which are acting as a raw material are goods are sent for the manufacturing process there will be again an entry when the manufacturing will come will be completed there again will be entry in the fixed finished goods register so therefore the entire chain of receipt and the finished will be maintained by those manufacturing companies and there is always a concept of yield in any manufacturing process so therefore the yield of the market can be calculated out of it at the same time there can be multiple other factors which we can harp upon and which we can justify before the uh, adjudicating authority or before the court of the law but important is maintenance of those books and accounts if i am able to maintain those books of accounts and substantiate before the adjudicating authority or the appellate authority or the court i am of the view that it may take some time but a genuine tax payer will not be in trouble so that is a case wherein a genuine tax payer can are also rather many cases i am handling are also made victim of this fake invoicing rackets because scrap industry as i have said now they are dealing with their agents now they they make a call avinash make a call to mr y who is an agent he tenders his requirement to that mr y mr y supplies those goods through mr x and he says that mr x is supplying the goods to you he is a supplier and the goods are received along with the invoice e way bill and all other documents avinash take records of everything even the copy even the photograph of the vehicle loading downloading everything he is taking care of but still the department says that the x who is said to be supplier in your case never existed he has never conducted any business he is merely a fake invoice supplier so the department can allege that mr we have arrested mr x and he has given a statement that he has made no supplies to anyone and all the invoices which he has issued are merely invoices are not supported with any movement of goods now in this case i am a bona fide purchaser avinash is a bona fide purchaser he is not a fraud he is not at all involved and he has received the goods also invoice also and at the most this is under his control to check whether he has received the goods along with the e way bill and all the particulars which are specified and mentioned there are proper and legal or not he cannot go beyond that so therefore always remember one maxim which is very very relevant here which is lex non cogit ad impossibilia it says something or an act which is impossible otherwise and which is imposed to be followed is not a good law so any law which contemplates an act or a situation which otherwise is impossible is not a good law it's a bad law so therefore second condition was receipt of goods and the solution is please bear in mind maintain the books and records very very clearly and meticulously because that is something which is in your control 
and whatever is in your control, if you are able to justify that to the court of the law, then certainly I'm, I'm very sure about it, that certainly the court will consider it and we can come out of this, this mess. Third, I'm not reading and I'm not discussing anything. Rather, I, I do not have any material also with me. But there are two clauses also which have been added, clause double A. So I'm not dealing with that today because that is something which, which will not serve our purpose because the topic is taken away. So therefore, I will cover only those relevant aspects which can help us to understand the fake invoicing and the defense of the allegation of fake invoice in a better manner. Now, clause C, which is under challenge before various high courts, and very soon we'll will or we may we may expect judgments also. And there is always al already a Calcutta single bench judgment, LGW Industries. Now, what does Clause C says? Because the department also alleges Clause C, 16 to Clause C in most of the cases. <coughs> it says that the recipient who is availing input tax credit, subject to Section 41 or 43 capital A, now it has been amended because 43 is removed, omitted. Subject to that section of 41 or 43 A, the person who is claiming input tax credit must assure that the supplier has discharged the liability of the invoice on which the credit is claimed or availed by the recipient. Now, tell me one thing. Is it possible for a recipient to identify, to understand that the supplier has paid or not? Is there any mechanism which is provided in law? As per my understanding, no. There was a mechanism contemplated in the law by virtue of GSTR 1, 2 and 3. The entire chain was being covered. But now, since GSTR 2 and GSTR 3 has been dispensed with by the department, by the government, there is no mechanism as such. There is a mechanism of accepting the liability I'm repeating, there is a mechanism of accepting the liability by way of filing GSTR capital one or GSTR one, showing that yes, I have made certain supplies to Mr. Avinash, which will be reflected in GSTR two capital A or GSTR two capital B. Be beyond this, I don't think that I have any control to check whether this amount which is being shown in GSTR 1 accepted or admitted liability of the supplier has been discharged or not. I can at the most see that for the month of the supply, whether he has filed GSTR 3 capital B or not, but that will not suffice the reason, the, the purpose because the law says the invoice on which the credit is being availed the tax on that invoice must be paid, must be discharged. So therefore, this again is something which is attracted by the doctrine of lex non cogit ad impossibilia. So therefore, this is again something which is an impossible ask or an impossible responsibility casted on the taxpayer by the statute. And therefore, this provision needs to be read down appropriately. I'll not say that it needs to be declared as ultra virus, but yes, to a large extent, it needs to be read down because many genuine purchasers are in trouble because of this provision. So <clears throat> now there is no mechanism to say that yes, he has made the payment. And then LGW Industries is a judgment wherein it is clearly said by the Honorable, Gujarat, Honorable Calcutta High Court that if the departmental officers are able to prove the connivance of the supplier and the recipient, then only the credit can be challenged and denied to the recipient. Otherwise, the credit cannot be denied. 
so that is a welcome judgment arise india and a lot of judgments in vat run over already there so we'll not be discussing on that so my endeavor today is only fake invoice so now they are alleging that these are fake invoices or rather the credits which you have availed on the basis of the invoices issued to you by this supplier he has never paid the tax on that so in that case you can very well take shelter of these arguments which i have placed and again in this situation also the allegation can be non payment or not discharge of liability but the allegation cannot be the fake invoice and last is that the recipient must have filed the return that anyways unless we file the return we will not be able to claim the input tax credit so therefore it is quite obvious that we have filed the return so the sum and substance of whatever we have discussed up till now is the allegation which the department poses on us or rather forces us is one the supplier is no more existent two his registration is cancelled su moto three he has not paid the taxes four you have never received the goods or services please bear in mind sir in all these four cases if the invoice is valid invoice it can never be said to be a fake invoice yes the credit can be challenged but if we are able to satisfy the four conditions which i have discussed just now are being satisfied by each one of you then in that case the credit also is a legally tenable credit to you now comes the question then what will happen to those cases wherein it is alleged and proved that the traveling was not there because nowadays you you will appreciate that the government has the control of the data to an extent that even the toll plaza invoices or the 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 toll receipts or the movement is there with the help of fast tags and everything so therefore <clears throat> if the situation is that yes to a large extent it is admitted that the goods were never received and therefore the invoice on which the credit is availed seems to be an invoice which is merely the receipt of invoice not the goods what will happen in that case my understanding is even in that case if i have availed the credit on those invoices then yes certainly 162 can be there and is a, a problem because we have not received the goods and for this only they have issued one circular <clears throat> and this circular deals with three different situations for which the department has suggested or the the uh, board has suggested the actions on those situations let us try to understand that on 6th july 2021 this circular was issued circular number is 171 and this is a circular which rather they have cl clarified and again i would say this is a circular this is not a notification this is not a law it's merely a circular circular yes it is binding on the departmental officers but it is not binding on we taxpayers and therefore if we find that there is something which is not legal in these circulars then certainly we can challenge these circulars or we can plead or defend our case accordingly the department may follow it that is not an issue so first situation what is the first example which they are giving again before going into these definitions let me first try to sum up the discussion that we have done please appreciate there is nothing called fake invoice provided it is a legally issued invoice by a registered person but there are provisions in law which provides for the non entitlement of itc as well as it also provides for the penalties for offenses so if i am showing that i have received goods from mr x and at the end of the day and i have rather connived with him and at the end of the day it is proved 
that Mr. X has issued only invoice to you, to me. In that case, the credit needs to be reversed because I, I was not entitled for input tax credit because section 16 subsection 2, which is a non obstant clause, I have violated section 16 2 clause B. But if there was no movement of goods, there was only issuance of invoice, then in that case, section 122 subsection 1 clause 2 or clause 7 will be applicable because that is something which is considered to be an offense, an act which is illegal act, issuance of invoice without the issuance of goods or availment of input tax credit without or rather availment of input tax credit only on the basis of such invoices. And second, supply of goods without supporting it with an invoice. All these are offenses under GST under section 122 subsection 1 and therefore liable for being penalized. Now what does the circular say? Circular first question say that in case where A is a registered person. So therefore this is important that he is a registered person. He issues a tax invoice to another registered person B without any underlying supply of goods or services or both. Now the question is, so you can understand the, the transaction per se. A is a registered person, B is a registered person. A supplies certain goods to registered person. Question is, uh, sorry, A supplies invoices to registered person without supply of goods. The question is whether it will be covered within the definition of supply. And if it is to be considered under the definition of supply, whether the proceeding can be under section 73 or 74 or some other section. So now the question is, what is supply or the scope of supply? We all are aware about the term supply. Now supply section 7 clearly says that it needs to comply with certain conditions and the department the the board has clarified that this transaction will not be falling within the purview of supply therefore it is out of section 7 and since it is not a supply because supply of invoice is not a supply under gst some and substance of this conclusion or clarification by the department is if you are supplying only a document to someone that is not a supply so the clarification which they have given is that merely issuance of tax invoice is no supply. Uh, it has to be issued other, along with the goods, underlying goods or services, which is not there in this case. So therefore, the invoice which is issued by A to B is not an invoice which can be said or which can be said that uh, it is an invoice covered by the term or the scope of supply under section 7. So since it is not a supply, can the proceeding under section 73 or 74 begin? Now please try to be with me for next two minutes. It's already 5.45. I'll try to conclude within 30 minutes uh, after discussing with the provisions of arrest also. I'll try to expedite. Now please be with me for two minutes. Section 73 and section 74, what is that? Section 73 says, whenever there is a short payment, non-payment, erroneous refund or wrongful availment or utilization of input tax credit, then a shokas notice can be issued and the amount can be recovered. That is section 73. And in all those, these four situations, that is non-payment, short payment, erroneous refund and wrongful availment or utilization of input tax credit. If fraud element is involved, then section 74 will be involved. So whether this transaction where A issues an only invoice to B and B takes credit. So what will be the treatment in these two cases? A is supplying invoice which is not considered under section 7. So therefore, section 73, 74, 
four proceedings cannot be initiated against him. It will be section 122, which says, section 122, subsection 1, clause 2, which says, supply of invoice without supply of goods. So, in case of A, there will be a penalty under section 122. But what about in case of B? Again, we need to appreciate that if he has received goods and forget about the technicalities, then in that case, the department will say that you have received the goods without underlying invoices. And therefore, these goods are liable for confiscation. So either section 130 proceedings can be initiated or the ITC which has been availed on the invoice which was merely supplied as an invoice and the goods were not there, the ITC can be reversed. So this was the first situation. Now let us come to the second situation which is given by them in, in uh, circle number 171. Now here they say that a registered person, A is a registered person who has issued the tax invoice to another registered person B without any supply of goods or services or both. B avails the input tax credit on the basis of the said invoices. And then B further issues the invoice to C. Along with the underlying goods, he is again issuing the invoices to, let's say, C. And he is availing the input tax credit on the goods or rather on the invoice which he has received from A. So what will happen in this case? So we have already discussed that the allegation would be the violation of section 16, subsection 2, clause B, that he has not received the goods on the invoices on which the input tax credit has been claimed and therefore he will be covered within 73-74 proceedings and he will receive a show cause notice and it will be adjudicated accordingly. And please bear in mind, one very important aspect to be kept in mind is section 75, subsection 3. If section 74 is invoked and the tax interest and penalty is levied on him, then in that case, 122 cannot be levied. There cannot be two penalties for the same one offense. Otherwise, it will violate Article 20 of the Constitution of India. Now, third point. Third point is, A has made supply of invoice to B without goods or services. B avails input tax credit and further passes on the credit to C, who is another registered person without supply of any invoice. So what has happened is this is circular trading to, a, to some extent, not to a large extent because A to B, B to C, and then the chain breaks there. It, this, as per me, is not a circular trading. Circular trading is when A to B, B to C, C to again A. Then that covers the entire circular of, uh, circle of circular trading. But what does the law provides or what does the clarification provide? Sir? They say, see, A has supply invoices to them without goods to B. B has taken credit and again supplied invoices to C without goods. Therefore, all these three will be getting the notices. A, no invoice, uh, only invoice sent, meaning thereby section 7 is not there, supply is not there, only 122 penalties, which we have already de dealt with. B, he has availed ITC and then passed on the ITC. So again, 73, 74 proceedings will be there. C, he has received the invoices. Obviously, he will avail the ITC and then make the further supply. So therefore, this will cover within the purview of section 73 and 74. That is something which is specified by them very clearly. And we need to also mention one very important aspect here. What is this transaction and how it is different from the question number two? Question number two, he has supplied, B has supplied with supporting goods to the third person. In this case, it is purchase of invoice and purchase of or sell of invoice by B. So B has not received any goods. He has not received any supply and therefore the supplies made by B also will be challenged and therefore section 73 and 74 proceedings in that case 
can also be equated to section 122 proceedings because supply of goods rather supply of invoice without supply of goods that will also cover him and receipt of invoices without goods that will also cover him so therefore section 122 subsection 1 clause 2 and section 122 subsection 1 clause 7 both provisions will be attracted and b will be liable for penal action under both these sections of the act for issuance of invoices without actually supply of goods and utilizing or taking input tax credit without actual receipt of goods so there is no question of any other allegation this is the sum and substance that 122 penalty will be levied on him if the proceedings are under section 74 then certainly the penal provisions will be imposed under section 74 and not under section 122 so this is uh, what i wanted to discuss in fake invoice and because of the paucity of time and i'll not be able to give further examples and deliberate further but the only one aspect that i would like to cover here and then we'll move to the arrest and that is that section 122 subsection 1 capital a is also very very relevant because there are cases wherein there is one mastermind who takes pan card of different persons opens up different companies and then finally he issues only invoices from those companies and take the benefit uh, of the law. So in that case, <coughs> section 122, subsection 1A clearly says a person who causes such offense and retains benefit. So therefore, a person who is advising to do some such kind of offense and he is also retaining some benefits out of it he also can be levied 100% penalty under section 122 subsection 1 capital A. So this is something which we need to keep in mind uh, while defending the cases wherein the allegation is pertaining to circular trading, fake invoices, not received of goods, that means only received of invoices. In all these cases, you will have to keep all these provisions in mind and accordingly you need to frame your defense. Now, friends, coming to the arrest provisions. Very quickly, we'll try to deal with that because this is this may not be uh, something which we all are not aware of and therefore uh, not much time is required in this. But yes, I have some beliefs which I would like to share with all of you. Now, first and foremost is there has to be an offense. <clears throat> and that offense has to be a punishable offense. Now, section 132 has to be read along with section 69 of the GST law. Section 69 deals with power to arrest. The law says that the commissioner must be a person who should issue the arrest memo. The law says that the commissioner must have a reason to believe that the person has committed an offence which is specified in clause A, B, C, D of section 132 and which is punishable under clause 1, clause 2 of subsection 1 or subsection 2 of the said section that is 132. Then in that case, the commissioner by way of an order authorize any officer of central tax to arrest the person. Now, please appreciate, law says commissioner. So there arose a dispute and the dispute was whether the commissioner is only empowered or commissioner can delegate these powers to someone else. So in that case, there is a judgment of Nilesh by Natu by Patel. You can note it down. It is Nilesh by Natu by Patel versus State of Gujarat. 131taxman.com, 222 Gujarat High Court. Gujarat High Court in this case has denied the bail. And what they have said is, that even the power can be delegated by the commissioner to his subordinate officer. And the subordinate officer in that case must have the reason to believe that the arrest is important. 
now i'll not go into the the theory of it but practically in 10 minutes let us try to understand what is arrest how it is contemplated in the gst what defenses we are taking and what is the provision and what is the situation of availing a bail or getting enlarged on bail friends please appreciate arrest is a precautionary measure and prosecution is the final trial which happens in court and then the court decide law says that there are two kind of offenses one cognizable and non billable offense and two non cognizable and billable offense so clause 1 clause 2 of section 132 sub section 1 it provides that if the liability exceeds 5 crores and the second situation can be if you have collected the amount and not paid for a period exceeding 3 months in that case the offense becomes cognizable and non billable meaning thereby non billable does not mean that you will not get a bail, get a bill or you are not entitled for being enlarged on bail it means that the person who is arresting who steps into the shoes of the police officer he will not be able to enlarge you on bail and therefore within a period of 24 hours he will have to produce the person who is arrested before the magistrate and then the magistrate will decide whether the bail has to be given to him or he has to be sent on the judicial to the judicial custody so cognizable and non billable and non cognizable and billable the only difference is in cognizable and non billable offense the offense the person who is committing the offense or the offender must be produced by the officer who is arresting him within a period of within a within 24 hours before the magistrate and then the magistrate will have to decide whereas in offenses which are less than 5 crores which are uh, non cognizable and billable even the officer if we are able to convince him or he is convinced and and uh, satisfied then in that case he can enlarge the person on bail on the bail so that is the primary difference now provisions we all are aware of the second question which is there or which triggers to the mind of everyone is can an arrest power be exercised prior to adjudication that means before adjudicating the case before finalizing the liabilities can arrest be done so there was judgment in service tax make my trip wherein it was said that no it cannot be done but i differ from that view reason being as i have already stated that arrest is precautionary therefore if the commissioner has a reason to believe that in the given circumstance avinash is an offender and if he is not arrested or if he is not taken into the judicial custody there may arise a situation that avinash may abscond number 1 he may tamper with the evidences he may tamper with the witnesses or he may cause more danger to the economy and the society then in that case the commissioner on the basis of such reasons to believe he can issue an order in writing that why he considers arrest to be exercised and then he can certainly arrest the person or issue an order of arrest or or invoke the power to arrest for that if we argue that it is not adjudicated the figures are not determined the liability is not determined and therefore it should not be he should not be arrested i think for that we need to rely upon one very important judgment of gujarat high court i would wish everyone to take cognizance of that it is vimal yashwant giri goswami 
विमल यशवंत गिरी गोस्वामी वर्सेज स्टेट ऑफ गुजरात टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन दिस जजमेंट ऑफ विमल यशवंत गिरी गोस्वामी वेरी क्लियरली डील्स विद द पावर्स ऑफ अरेस्ट एंड द क्वेश्चन दैट कैन अरेस्ट हैपन प्रायर टू एजुडिकेशन सो इन दिस टू बी वेरी ब्रीफ वॉट द कोर्ट सेट कोर्ट सेट दैट फर्स्ट एंड फॉरमोस्ट यू नीड टू चेक whether the arrest is compulsory or not or arrest is mandated in this given circumstance or not if not then do not exercise that power so as i have already stated tampering with the evidence tampering with the documents running away absconding creating more loss or more damage to the society or economy as a whole then he, he has to be arrested or maybe for getting his statements recorded or producing the evidences or witnesses or giving the entire trail the arrest is required court said you will have to look into each circumstance and therefore before starting the session at the time of starting itself i have said that the topic which is given to me is purely subjective and i am not here to read the law because we all are learned enough and we all are aware of what what are the provisions how it is written what is the gst uh, situation i am here to share my experience and my views so therefore the law said the law which is written down in vimal yashwant giri goswami by the honorable gujarat high court has clearly said that no we straight forward cannot say that prior to adjudication the arrest cannot happen it can happen it can be a situation that the person can be arrested but you will have to look into that why you believe that he is he is going to abscond he is not going to pay he is going to temper with the evidences maintain that put that in order in black and white and then you can certainly use the power of arrest so therefore if it is required in the interest of the revenue then even the arrest can happen prior to adjudication that is vimal goswam uh, yashwantram goswam then there is a case of bombay high court tejas ungad that again clearly says and there is a paragraph which says that these kind of offenses are damaging the economy as a whole and therefore all those persons who are creating fake forms getting the input tax credits and circulating such input tax credits rather passing on such input tax credits are damaging the entire economy and therefore the arrest has to be there and bail should not be granted so there are number of cases which can be relied upon which can be discussed but because of the paucity i'll not be there i'll not be uh, like willing to discuss that because 10 minutes i want to devote for the question answers if any questions are there certainly i'll like to address that but now let let me come to another another limb of my discussion there happened to be a case which was adjudicated and an interim relief was given by the honorable supreme court the arguments in those case in that case was that look department is alleging that avinash has offended and the liability which is expected to be from his offense would be around 20 crores to be precise it was 19 crore in that case and there is a provision in law that after the adjudication within a period of 3 months we have a statutory alternate remedy which is said to be or which is called as appeal before the first appellate authority and the pre deposit which has to be given and after paying that pre deposit the entire proceeding of a recovery will be stayed is 10% so the counsel for the petitioner argued before the court honorable supreme court that even after the adjudication if i pay 10% the entire recovery will be stayed i am ready to pay 10% i should not be arrested 
that was a case wherein the arrest had not happened. The case was C. Pradeep versus Director General of GST, that is DGGI. large extent and we all are aware that now getting a bail in those in in cases wherein the allegation of fake units creation and the fake itc uh, uh, passing on the bails are not given so easily unless we prove our bona fide so now i come to the last limb of my discussion can an order issued by honorable high courts or a supreme court or a sessions court enlarging a person on bail has presidential value meaning thereby can i say that if avinash was enlarged on bail by bombay high court in this similar facts and circumstance, Mr. X, who is now arrested, should also be enlarged on bail. Is that precedence available? In that regards, my humble understanding would be no. It cannot be. We can certainly rely upon the order of Avinash in my case. But the prerogative to enlarge a person or enlarge an arrested person on bail is always of the judge who is deciding that case. So this is an important limb and therefore I have cautiously included this in my discussion that merely someone has been enlarged on bail cannot put us in a comfortable situation that we would also get the bail. Because it purely depends. Yes, as I've already stated that we can certainly, we can certainly rely upon those judgments. The court may entertain, the court may also consider those judgments. But at the same time, please appreciate the court may not consider in many cases. So therefore, we cannot bind. So the, the sum and substance of my discussion is, can it be a binding order on the lower court or the similar court, coordinate benches? My understanding says no. It is purely discretionary power. A judge has a discretion to decide whether a person should be enlarged on a bail or not. Friends, let me try to uh, sum up the entire discussion. We have started with the discussion on fake invoices. I have very clearly stated what I understand. Nowadays, there are a number of cases wherein the allegation of fake invoices is there and the department majorly is harping upon non-receipt of goods or services or absconding that is the, the supplier is not existent or the registration of supplier is cancelled from retrospective date. These are major three allegations which are on the recipients and therefore the ITC is being denied to them and the harsh actions of bank account attachment or maybe arrest is being taken against them. So we need, we'll have to first have a legally valid invoice. Two, we must have accounts and records which are properly maintained in accordance with section 35 of the law. And therefore, we must be in a position to substantiate that this is how we have received the goods and this is how we have supplied. And we have never connived with anyone. So in that case, if we have never connived with anyone, there is no question of we being denied the credit or uh, on the basis of the allegation. And then we have also discussed about the arrest. The provision of arrest is very simple. A commissioner has the power, but 
there are few questions which I have certainly touched upon. One, can an arrest be done prior to adjudication? In Vimal Gos Goswami case, Vimal Yashwant Giri Goswami, please read that judgment of Gujarat High Court. It's a difficult, it's a big judgment, a lot, I, I think 80 pages judgment and very clearly it, it, is, it has dealt with all the uh, jurisprudence of arrest. Two, as per me, that is relevant because can, because the law contemplates the commissioner must have reason to believe. Now, can that power be delegated? Because it is not commissioner in board which is written. It is commissioner. So, can a commissioner delegate its power? So, I have dealt with the judgment of Honorable Gujarat High Court, a very recent judgment of Nilesh Bhai Natubai Patel. Uh, that judgment clearly says that yes, it can be delegated. On 14th October 2021, this judgment was given. And then we also tried to dwell upon the argument of C. Pradeep that if I pay 10% upfront, then I should not be arrested. That was given in C. Pradeep by the Honorable Supreme Court. In most of the cases, this case is being referred. But as I've already stated that one order of bail may not impress the judge and therefore in the facts and circumstances which he is dealing with he may not get impressed and such judgments are not having the binding effect are certainly recommendatory are certainly referable but those cannot bind unlike the other judgments maybe uh, a judgment of let's say uh, ocean flood, which is recently, it is binding on every, everyone without jurisdiction. Like, uh, any jurisdiction, the order is binding. But a uh, bail order is not having that binding effect as per my limited understanding. So friend, this was uh, what I wanted to cover today in on the topic which was allotted to me. Uh, I would like to hand over to the committee member or the coordinators for any questions of the participants. If any questions are there, I'll certainly be happy to answer that. Over to the coordinators, please. Very, um, can we take up the questions? Uh, I can see two questions which is there in the chat box. Uh, how to establish whether the vendor was duly registered at the time of in issue of invoice in case where registration is cancelled retrospectively? See, this is something, this question is a valid question because most of us rely on the document which we receive at the time of receipt of goods or services. And generally we do not have the tendency to go to the portal and check whether the registration is valid or not. So in this, what we are doing is, or what we are suggesting to many of our clients is to do a KYC. That the, 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 the time when we receive the goods from a vendor for the very first time, we do a basic KYC of that person. And at that, in that KYC, we can also check whether he is registered in that, on that particular day or not. In case he is registered, then certainly we can accept the goods and then uh, there is no problem at all and we'll be able to justify. But yes, for all those purchases which he, which we have already made without keeping a track whether he was registered or not, it is certainly a challenge. But at the same time, there are ways and means wherein we can understand on which date or date of the order which has cancelled the registration retrospectively. If that date of order is after the date of your purchase, then in that case, certainly we'll be able to establish that the, the date on which we have purchased the goods or the services which were received were within the bracket when the person or when the supplier was registered. There is the, the next question which is there uh, is, uh, what about service invoice as it doesn't have proof of delivery like eBay bill delivery, chalan, etc. How recipient will prove it is not a fake invoice? 
this is something which is very very difficult to answer reason being its services are intangible in nature we cannot touch it we cannot feel it obviously there is no proof of delivery of those services but there can be a corroborative evidence of receipt of a service say for example you as a chartered accountant are issuing an opinion note and you are availing a service let's say of avinash pudar in helping you in framing that opinion note so we can corroborate this with an evidence let's say you have made a phone call to me that phone call records can be submitted that yes you have received the services maybe a mailer maybe some document which can be created so as to establish the receipt of service maybe you have received a phone call from me you can just send a mail to me saying that yes we have received a phone call as per our discussion so and so this is what we have discussed that will establish that we have received a service from so and so person but yes i agree with the 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 person who is asked this question that yes it is challenging to prove that whether we have received the goods or services but it can be proved with the corroborative evidences if we are because we all are aware ignorance is not an excuse we simply say that we have not recorded that may not help us so therefore when we are entering into a business we are availing an input tax credit on the invoices that we are receiving on uh, for the services that we are receiving we'll have to create an evidence we'll have to establish an evidence which can corroborate this this uh, this itc and prove that yes we have received maybe by way of a mail maybe by way of a document creation an invoice or anything like that but yes it is challenging i do agree with this uh there were only two questions uh in the chat box so um uh, i think we can conclude the session i would like to really thank uh, advocate ca avinash poddar ji for taking up this topic of fake invoicing and arrests under the uh, you know the offense uh, he, i think uh, he would not have, we would not have got a better speaker than him on this particular topic because i think he has already uh, represented uh, many uh, cases in uh, courts uh, and he has his own experience of uh, addressing this issue so i think participants participants would have largely benefited uh, by the by, you know the way he has explained the topic of fake invoicing uh, giving various examples various circumstances and the ways to deal with it and how an ssc can prepare, uh, present his case uh i think uh, and what precautions the ssc can take and what uh, you know sir circumstances he can uh, present to defend himself i think uh, he has given an extremely wonderful presentation uh, his discussion was really vivid and i am sure everybody would have largely benefited uh, and they will be definitely getting benefited in the future uh, you know the cases which they will be taking up in litigations which they are facing so we extremely uh, extremely thankful to see avinash poddar ji for his excellent deliberation thank you so much ma'am thank you so much thank you wrc uh, so now uh, the next topic is uh, uh, to be taken by uh, ca jatin harjai he would be taking uh, the topic of uh, litigation in absence of tribunal uh, i would uh, I, uh, i would like to introduce him first yeah uh, jitin harjai ji is a practicing advocate he is a ca plus he is llb and also uh, has taken a uh, uh, degree in disa he is a practicing chartered accountant with more than 15 years uh, in, in legal practice itself so we can understand how uh, you know uh, his uh, experience in uh, this legal profession is he has spoken on various uh, topics in uh, on vat cst entry tax works tax and gst and he has covered uh, 750 seminars or workshops as faculty or speaker in indirect taxes in almost all regions of india so apart from india he has shared his uh, knowledge in international seminars as well in uae thailand and tashkent so uh, you know his experience is really vivid 
He has represented in the tax advisory committee before CM of Rajasthan for giving recommendation and suggestion before state budget. Apart from TSE, he has also represented ICI, Rajasthan Tax Consultants Association, Tax Consultants Association Jaipur before commercial taxes department at various levels in relation to modification and VAT laws. Then he has given his services to various clients. He leads a team of professionals, which includes advocates, CAs, and CS. His core practice is in indirect taxes, and uh, he has served various corporates and entrepreneurs, including listed companies in varied areas like consulting, due diligence, structuring, and litigation. He is having vast industry experience, and he is also an accredited trainer of NASIN, which is National Academy of Customs and Indirect Taxes Government of India for GST training to be provided to trade and industry as well as GST officers of the central government. He, apart from being panel GST trainer of ICI, Jatinji is also was part of faculty identification and trained the trainer program of India G, Indian GST as well as UAE VAT, uh, whereby he selected members of the institute from various parts of the country and provided them training of Indian GST. Uh, he's a keen learner. He has uh, contributed in various uh, professional bodies in different capacities as co-opted member of National Indirect Tax Committee of Federation of Indian Industry. He was a special invitee member of National Indirect Tax Committee of ICI. Then uh, he was a panelist in many, uh, many uh, events organized by CIRC, EIRC. He's, uh, then, uh, his qualifications, of course, I have already discussed. So I think I will not take much of the time and uh, I would uh, hand over the uh, platform to CA Jatin Harjai to take forward. Welcome, sir. Uh, Jatin, sir, have you, uh, I think he's joined. Hi, ma'am. Jatin, sir, has joined. Yes, I'm joined here. Join yeah, here. So, hmm. Can we call him and tell him that, uh, you know, he has to take up the topic? Karado second. Yeah, sure. We are waiting for the speaker to join. Uh, please bear with us. Ma'am, two minutes. Oh, kuch net ka issue aa raha hai. Oh, join hi hai. Two minutes. Yeah, sure. So we request the participants to please have patience. Uh, there is some technical issue at uh, the speaker's end. He will uh, join very soon.
I think he's rejoining the session. Welcome, Jatin, sir. Uh, uh, I think you have joined in. So kindly take up the session. Can I you hear? hear you. Just... Sir, we can hear you. Is it audible to you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Okay. Just a minute, I think there is some error at my system. There appears to be some error with my system. Okay, give me a minute. Let me log in through a different uh, system. Sure, sir, no problem. Please take your time. Is it audible to you now? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yes, I think uh, it's good with me as well. No problem, sir. Thank you. Welcome to the session. The PPT, you No PPT. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a small confusion. Hello. I mean, actually, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I've just checked in the morning. Uh, email I have, that is the topic to be covered is a fake invoices. I recollect I shared the pale uh, kuchor topic bola tha. So can you tell can me? You, uh, so your topic is litigation in absence of tribunal. Fine. Good. No problem. Yes, sir. So, uh, fake invoices I'm not, Avinash ji ne cover kar liya, correct? Yes, sir. Avinash sir has already covered it. Good, good, good. I, I think uh, there is a mistake in the email. So, why did I have a time to find the topic? We were fake invoices. So, okay, so, we apologize for this inconvenience. That's, that's all, everything is all good from my side. Yes, sir. Sure. Should I start? Of course, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I've already introduced you actually. So okay. I think Avinash sir, uh, Jatin sir was not present when I introduced him. No problem, no problem. So yes. should I take the introduction again? No, 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 no not at all. Not at all. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Waiting Sorry. for maybe uh, you are going to announce that we are we are supposed to start. Anyways, so first of all, uh, my very good friend who is a co-panelist here, Avinash Podarji, uh, Meenakshi ji, coordinator, and I can see here Heniksha. Uh, a very good, uh, good evening to all of you and all the participant viewers. So in fact, I'm sure uh, you must have enjoyed the session of uh, Avnash Bhai. Both the interesting and uh, I must say very, very relevant topic, how to deal with the fake invoices, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure that here you must have dealt in uh, great depth and you must be enriched with all those, uh, his words of wisdom. So not topic uh, which I am supposed to take up is, uh, is like uh, litigation in absence of the uh, tribunal. 
sounds like a topic is uh, nothing to do with any st specific or statutory provisions. Uh, what to do in absence of the tribunal? We all know that there is a uh, order passed by the government. Special uh, rodo is passed by for them that if the tribunal is not there, you can wait and watch till the time tribunal gets constituted and uh, your time barring will start only from the day when the tribunal actually starts function. So this is what a very, very uh, small, I would say, uh, conclusion of one liner conclusion of this particular topic. But I would take this opportunity to discuss with you some of the basic aspects which are required when we are going to deal with the tribunal or maybe first appellate authority, or maybe I'll touch upon the high court as well. One is one step uh, downwards and one step upwards. Before I start the specific uh, pointer, which I have in my mind, one thing which I would like to start with is that all of us, all of participants who are here must be clear in, his, in their minds that the proceedings of collection under the law are threefold proceedings. Any of the proceedings of the collection are threefold proceedings within the uh, statutory provisions. First, it is initiation or starting of any inquiry by the departmental officers obviously after filing of your returns. Then there comes adjudication. And once there is any demand in the adjudication, recovery comes into picture. There cannot be any recovery before adjudication, which we see normally when, whenever there is any inquiry is initiated, department presses to the assessee to pay the demand as soon as possible. They make pressure. If I talk about inquiry, inquiry may be of uh, multiple type under the GST law. It may be like scrutiny or a summon, whereby department calls the assessee, calls the taxpayer at their office on a predetermined date and time. <clears throat> Secondly, there can be a bit harder kind of inquiry like audit. In that case, what's going to happen? The department officers will go to the premises of the taxpayer and then will check on a, obviously on a predefined date and time. The third kind of inquiry can be a bit more harder, which is a kind of inspection. The tax officers will go to the premises of the taxpayer without any intimation. And the fourth and the last, I would say, uh, most powerful tool, search and seizure. Departmental officer will go to the premises of the taxpayer without intimation and with uh, and are having a greater power. That means even like uh, if you are not cooperating, break, breaking up one of the lock, seizure of things, something, something like this. So this, but whatever it is, whatever kind of inquiry uh, powers they are having in the different kind of inquiry proceedings. But one thing is for sure, this is not an adjudication. This is not a collection proceeding. This is not a final collection or a recovery proceeding. These all are the inquiries. Once there is a conclusion of the inquiry and the officers are of the opinion that whether tax has not, uh, either tax has not been paid or short paid or input tax credit has been wrongly availed or utilized or erroneous refund has been granted, then adjudication proceedings has to start. Once adjudication is over, that means there is a final order from the authority that so much of the demand is there. Then as per section 78, the taxpayer is having three months time to pay their dues. After three months, only recovery proceedings can start. So one inquiry, second adjudication, and then recovery. Before that, reco uh, recovery cannot be before adjudication. So uh, this is what we have to understand. If time permits or if there is a maybe some query on this particular aspect, because I'll, practically we see that actually I, and nowadays, what happened? Recovery comes first. So, so many high courts from the our uh, country has uh, came had came heavily on this that it, it is not a correct provision, including Punjab, Telangana, Karnataka. So many uh, courts we have Madras we have seen 
that they have specifically in their orders have said that it is not permissible within the statutory provisions that you first recover and then go for adjudication or something like this. Now, coming to this adjudication part, what happens whenever there is an order is passed, then assessee is having a statutory right to file the appeal. First appeal under section 107, second appeal before the appeal at tribunal under section 112. When we go to appeal, the, what happens, first of all, we need to know that we need to understand that appellate mechanism or proceeding is nothing but an extension of the adjudication process itself. It is a specific extension of the adjudication process itself, which has been passed by the adjudicating authority. Continuation of the adjudication process, we can say. But recovery in those circumstances is restricted as well is restricted, but not with this, with specific conditions. For example, an adjudication order has been passed by the assessing authority. Now what happens if you are going to file the appeal for which again, you are having a three months time, then you're supposed to pay 10% of the disputed tax amount. We all know this 10% of the disputed tax amount. For example, let us say there is a demand hundred rupee of the tax. 100 rupee of the interest and 100 rupee of the print, uh, penalty, just for an uh, hypothetical example. In that, in that case, for whole of the 300, uh, let's say 300 rupee demand, you will have to pay 10 rupee as a pre-deposit for filing of the first appeal, first appeal. And rest of the demand will get stayed as per provision section 107, subsection 6, right with subsection 7. If we go to second appeal, let us assume the client of the case has been rejected by the appeal authority. They have not uh, uh, allowed the appeal. In that case, the appeal is to be filed before the appeal at tribunal as per the statutory provisions. And in that case, section 112 specifically says that additional 20% of the pre deposit is required for filing of the appeal before the appeal at tribunal. Section 112, subsection 9 should be there, which says, yes, subsection 8, sorry, not 9. Subsection 8 is, 8 is there, which says that 20% of the additional, that means 10% has already been paid, 20% uh, extra has to be paid for filing of the appeal before the tribunal. That means total would, would be 300. Uh, in our case of 300 rupee demand, total 30 rupee has to be deposited. That is 30% of the tax amount. Now see, there is an interesting aspect. The clause 9, which talks about the stay of the demand in section 112 and subsection 7 in section 107, that is first appeal third, has been very interestingly drafted, I would say. And the, maybe another conclusion, or you may get the conclusion of, in this clause itself of today's session. See, Normally people say, or I might also have uh, said that once you are, you have filed the appeal, then remaining balance, remaining amount will get stayed. But this is what now, this is not the statutory provision. Statutory provision is drafted uh, in some different manner. See this subsection nine says, let me read it for all of you. Where the appellant has paid the amount as per subsection eight. Subsection eight is, which talks about deposition of another 20% amount of the tax uh, tax uh, demand. The recovery proceeding for the balance amount shall be deemed to be stayed till the disposal of the appeal. Please mind, it is not referring to the filing of the appeal. It is not referring to the, for, for getting the uh, stay on the demand, the act doesn't say that you need to file the appeal. It only says that you need to pay this much of the amount. Precisely, appeal is to be filed within some, uh, in some, let me uh, rephrase all the provisions of that appeal before the tribunal. Subsection one says that you can file the appeal before the appellate tribunal when you are aggrieved uh, from the order passed by the first appellate authority that is under section 107. Subsection eight says that no appeal shall be filed unless this much of the pre-deposit is uh, uh, pre-deposit has been made, this much of the amount has been paid. 
that means period this deposit amount will definitely be before filing of the appeal and subsection 9 says the amount you have the moment you have deposited this much of the amount your demand will get stayed that means it is linked with the date when you deposit with the deposit the amount meaning thereby what i want to say or maybe communicate it to you that let's say first appeal has been filed first appeal has been disposed of then and now you know that the there is no second appeal available gst tribunal has not been constituted now what to do because what going to happen a uh, departmental officer may come or rather if you are not doing uh, going to do anything and first appeal you have lost in that case i, I must say that they'll come to you and will ask to deposit the amount if you are not going to deposit definitely they may initiate the recovery proceedings as well so in that circumstances one can do one uh, one can deposit 20% of the amount which is required as per section 112 and intimate the department that i have done deposited the this much of the amount which is required by section 112 sub section 8 and as per 112 sub section 9 the rest of the, the demand has got stayed so this is what from the statutory provision itself you need not to go anywhere this is what how i am going to read this particular aspect so one may proceed with this aspect if you want to file the appeal now having said so please mind we need to understand this aspect as well or we need to touch this aspect that why any tribunal is required tribunal has a very very important role to play very important role see many a times when you you are going to discuss maybe internally or with some lawyers the moment first of all authority has passed the order maybe you maybe advise or ultimately you may try to go to the high court itself but see high court is not that easy job because there is a flood of the cases in high court high courts are flooded with those cases and that is why only the tribunals are here see there are two important aspects due to which tribunals are very very important number 1 the tribunals deals with a very very specific statutory provisions or very very specific statutes for example gst appellate tribunal will be dealing with the gst law itat deals with the income tax law something like this sestet like deals with the indirect tax central excise service tax customs etc so the person the judge is sitting there member sitting in the bench are well versed with the legal provisions and what kind of disputes they are going to appreciate they become expert of them that is why the process gets very very fast in the tribunals unlike courts what happens you will see in the courts first of all there is a flood of cases number 2 variety of cases are being dealt by the judges not even one law or two law hundreds of laws are there in our country and the same judges are on the very same day dealing with the different 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 kind of cases quite possible when i am going to argue a gst case just before my case a criminal case of rape or maybe murder was getting discussed before the judges so you can understand the mindset of them it is not for a specific law rather they go by principles majorly not by very specifically statutory principles so zona is altogether different in the courts second independence what happens when we talk about when i said uh, that it is important that tribunals deals with a uh, some specific statutory provisions or maybe some specific statute so similar is the case with the first appellate authority as well but what happened first appellate authority for all 
for all practical purposes we know is ultimately subordinate to the departmental chief ultimately he administratively at least he reports to commission or chief commissioner as the case may be this is not the case with the gst appellate tribunal or any appellate tribunal so no that is why there is a independence independence of the members who are sitting there so that is i must say that tribunals are very very important in gst law what happened there is a constitution is being dealt by section 109110 of the cgst act the constitution of the tribunal what happened we have seen that why uh, we may discuss that why the tribunal could not get constituted i think you may refer the judgment of the honorable madras high court in the case of revenue bar association very three in, uh, interesting aspects were there which were being dealt by the honorable madras high court and they have specifically declared section 110 subsection 1 clause b as ultra virus similarly they have that is uh, similarly the two aspects were declared as ultra virus which i am just going to touch upon and on another aspect they have recommended some changes three aspects were like this first and foremost i must say that appointment of the officer from the indian legal services see the person who is going to sit in the national for national uh, tribunal and the state are going to be the judges of the high courts that uh, level judges would be there and they are going to accompany with the officers of the indian legal services so first of all their stature doesn't match number one so that is why the appointment of that level officer was being challenged before the appellate tribunal secondly one very important aspect was there that the tribunal which was uh, which is envisaged under the gst law is a three member tribunal three bench uh, judges are three bench would three persons would be there Three members bench would be there. One is a judicial member, and one is from the state government, and one is from the central. This is what how the structure of the tribunal is there. Now, what happens? Now you will see. Let us say if there is a difference of opinion between the members, what going to happen? It will be two is to one. if there is a difference of opinion in the members what what, what the outcome will be two is to one and it's quite possible that judicial member is thinking from one angle and another two members are thinking from another angle that means the state and center are thinking from their own way and the judicial member is thinking from the different this is what a gross violation of the principle which has been enumerated by the honorable supreme court for formation of any other tribunal in the case of r gandhi honorable supreme court has laid down that in any tribunal the judicial member cannot be less than 50% that means minimum strength of the judicial member would be 50% so now what going to happen in the case or i would say the statutory provisions are within the gst framework within the gst law says that it is one third judicial member is one third so this is a gross violation of the guidelines of the honorable supreme court for formation of formation or a constitution of the tribunal so this is what the another reason that the this particular provision has got quashed or struck down by the honorable high court third one more important aspect was there that you know that uh, the another aspect which was challenged in this petition was appointment of the advocate that the plea was made that when an advocate can become 
एडवोकेट इज अ क्वालिफिकेशन फॉर बिकमिंग द जज इन द हाई कोर्ट एज वेल इट सेल्फ एंड मोस्ट ऑफ द ट्रिब्यूनल्स इन अपॉइंटमेंट ऑफ मेंबर्स ऑफ द मोस्ट ऑफ द ट्रिब्यूनल डिफरेंट डिफरेंट ट्रिब्यूनल्स the advocate is a i would say the practicing advocate is qualified uh, uh, valid qualification but this is what no, uh, this is not the case under the in the gst ability this was also uh, matter was uh, raised the honorable court appreciated it and uh, referred the matter back to the parliament and the council that okay you may reconsider this aspect as well so due to these reasons the appellate tribunal got stuck now we have seen recently a group of minister has been made by the gst council to discuss the how the tribunal is to be made because they will have to come out of this particular aspect this particular uh, issue which has been narrated by the honorable uh, madras high court has highlighted now see i would like to uh, devote rest of my time approximately 1 hour on different principles which one should be having in their mind and uh, what should be highlighted or maybe what should be what kind of care you should have while you are having or discussing the maybe cases at the first appellate level then we uh, i think these aspects are important because uh, in cases when the first appellate authority has decided and let me see when uh, you are going to high court couple of things become very important or maybe to decide whether you should go for the high court or not this may be the one of the reason or as i discussed you may just uh, pre deposit 20% of the amount you may uh, remain happy couple of things which comes to my mind are first and foremost when uh, because see what happened uh, see in high court you will go in a writ petition not in the appellate forum because appeal can be filed in the high court but after the order of the tribunal only after order of the tribunal only but here you will have to if you are going to high court you will have to go in a writ remedy that is under the extraordinary jurisdiction of the high court under article 226 227 of the constitution of india so first of all whenever anyone goes to the writ remedy the first question which is being asked by the court is is there any alternate remedy available if alternate remedy is there then it is always that you avail that opportunity except for for specific situations there is a judgment from uh, honorable supreme court in case of whirlpool corporation which tells us even if there is an alternate remedy then also a person can go to writ petitions and high court should not reject or dismiss the writ petition on the ground of the alternate remedy those four exceptions are number 1 principle of natural justice are not being followed number 2 there is a violation of fundamental rights provided by the constitution of india number 3 jurisdiction is in dispute that the action which has been taken or which is purported to be taken the authority doesn't have the jurisdiction and number 4th is when there is a challenge to the virus of the provision that means you are challenging the virus of the statutory provision section so this these are the four specific points which has been explained by the honorable supreme court that in, in these four circumstances one may directly approach to the high court the best example i would say when i will suggest any client to go to high court in this particular scenario let let's discuss uh, the situations see what happens in one of the cases let's say different different let's take up different cases let's say in one of the cases demand has been confirmed by the authority and 
let's say I am in a situation, client is in a situation to deposit that particular 20% amount as well. But even after depositing of the 20%, department is insisting to pay remaining amount as well, despite the, irrespective of the fact whether the criminal has been constituted or not. In that case, you don't have any choice then to go to the high court. And in that case, you'll have to explain and say that, okay, see, this is the situation. I'm already having a stay, but these authorities are uh, not uh, adhering to it. And there is no fault on the part of the assessee for filing of the appeal because appeal at tribunal is not there. So in that case, I'm sure that the high court, uh, respective high courts will definitely give at least this relief that, okay, till the time of uh, constitution of the appeal and no recovery should be made. This relief I am expecting that each and every high court will give and has already given by the couple of high courts. Number two situation. Let us say you, are, you have filed first appellate, uh, appeal before the first appellate authority. The case got rejected. The appeal got dismissed without giving any relief. Now you see that a particular appellate authority has followed a particular circular. That due to these circular, since this position is clarified or legal position has been clarified by the circular, we believe that uh, the, your, uh, I would say appeal has been dismissed. Now see, practically for all, for all practical purposes, what's gonna happen? Let us say the tribunal gets constituted. You'll, you're going to file the appeal in the tribunal. Now what's gonna happen? Do you see that tribunal will disregard the circular? You're having an opinion that circular is not correct. I'll come upon uh, maybe after five to 10 minutes, I'll come upon the circular aspect as well. But see, will it be possible for the tribunal to disregard the circular? Number one, uh, see, Legally, I am saying, uh, legally it is not, circulars are not binding on even uh, any kind of judicial or quasi judicial authority, so not binding on the tribunal as well. But for all practical purposes, we have seen, normally tribunal follows circulars. So in that situation, I think the prudent position would be that you challenge that circular and go to the red petition because there is less chances that you will get relief from the tribunal. So it's the proper position, pro appropriate for the client to directly reach to the high court. Not an issue. In fact, one may directly seek the question of the circular and the moment they got a notice itself, even no need to go to the first appellate authority. Why to linger on the process? First you'll go to first appellate, maybe adjudication or uh, you'll appear before the adjudicating authority, then first appellate authority, maybe then wait for the tribunal. If there is a circular for all practical purposes, you are not going to leave at least at the level of the adjudication level and you know, first appellate level, for sure you are not going to get relief. And there is a very little chance that you get relief from the tribunal. But on this count, the petition will definitely be maintained. And if you are case is having a merits, then relief will be there from the honorable respective high courts. Same position is there in case of rules. Let us say you think a particular rule is, is being made by the government, which is not in line with the statutory provisions. There may be n number of situation in the GST law, like we have seen the fate of 89 disputes, I would say uh, in 89, there are so many disputes which are going in 121 as well. So many provisions are there in which the rules are there, which are disputed and prima facie, which appears to be in contradiction to the statutory provisions. That means from the position, the enactment, like rule 36 sub rule four. So in, if these kind of rules are under challenge or because of this rule, your case is uh, getting stuck, one may directly go to the high court in that case. And, uh, 
with the prayer of quashing of the rule because the, you'll get a relief only only and only when the rule get quashed or read down, not otherwise. So I think in that case, uh, one may, if there is any challenge to the provisions or maybe notification or rules or circular, in that case, it is always advisable to go to the court directly. This is what my opinion. One benefit and directly going to the courts are that you need not to pay uh, pre-deposit as well if it is a red petition. Now, the second aspect, which I said I'll discuss in maybe five minutes later, circular, that's very important. We all need to understand what kind of uh, authorities are there in circular. If I may ask the attendees, do you see or is there any specific provision which authorizes government to issue any circular? Is there any provision under the GST law? Can any person, okay. Can any person, any attendee tell me, is there any specific provision which says that the government may issue circular for clarifying so-and-so provision or something like this? We have seen yesterday, three important circulars were again issued by the government. Is there any provision? I'm waiting if uh, someone can respond on the chat box. No one has responded till now. Anyways, see, let me tell you, in my humble opinion, there is no provision in the law. There is no provision in the law which says that a circular is to be issued for so and so purposes. The only provision under the statute is section 168, which talks about issuance of instruction or directions. Let me read it for benefit of all. It says the board may, if it considers it necessary or expedient so to do for the purposes of uniformity in the implementation of this act, issue such orders, instruction or directions to the central tax officer as it may deem fit. And thereupon all such officers and all other persons employed in implementation of this act shall observe and follow such order, instruction or direction. So section 168 authorizes board to issue instruction direction to the officers for purposes implementation of uniform implementation of the act these order instruction direction comes in the form of or in the manner of a, the circular that is the way it comes couple of important aspect please mind circular is not the law circular is never the law I must refer judgment of Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Bengal Iron. See, please refer para 18 of that. Very, very important. In that, Honorable Supreme Court has in crystal clear terms said that any circular or clarification any circular or clarification issued by the central government or the state government is merely an opinion of the officers. It is not binding on the court, meaning thereby it's not the law. Just um, let me read exit para. That will be very useful for everyone. Very, very important one. Para number 18. Bengal Iron Corporation, 1994, Supplementary 1, SCC 310. It is specifically says, so far as clarification circular issued by the central government or the state government, in, in our case, we are getting circulars from the board, not even the government. Supreme Court says, issued by the central government or the state government are concerned, they represent merely their understanding of the statutory provisions. They are not binding upon the courts. 
कोर्ट के ऊपर किसी तरीके से बाउंड नहीं है दैट मीन इट इज नॉट अटूटरीज वॉट हैपन्स इट इज बाइंडिंग ऑन द अथॉरिटीज वेन देर इज अर्डर इंस्ट्रक्शन और डायरेक्शन एज वी है it is binding on the officers at themselves the moment it is binding on the officer you know that the circulars are being followed by the officers like bible geeta quran they want to read the officers normally don't want to read any act or they because there will be lots of interpretation issues will be there in the while someone is going to read the act and correlate the different provisions of them read with rules so whatever is written in the circular it is like a brahm vakya for officers and they follow that and there is a reason for them as well because it section 168 specifically says that it is uh, mandatory for the officers to follow those instruction direction and orders for the officers fine but it is not the law so one thing one one thing whenever you are contesting any a uh, particular case at any level you should keep this aspect in mind that circular are not the law one more aspect at times we have seen that those press releases are coming under the gst law different different press releases are coming different kind of press notes are there at some point of time some advertisement or in, we see something in media or clarifications earlier we used to see the tweet, uh, tweets also from the twitter and the are they have, are are any one of them including press release from the ministry of finance are they having any kind of legal standing please mind answer is absolutely no absolutely no zero standing this has been clarified by the honorable supreme court itself if someone wants to there is a judgment from the honorable supreme court in the case of uh, anjum mh ghaswala and para 32 is very relevant on it and i must that i must i suggest that each and every professional must read it reason being what happened many a time there are press releases under the gst which is issued by the ministry and at times we rely on them they cannot be relied on they cannot be in the similar situation what happened in one of the case the taxpayer has relied on the press release matter went up to supreme court the matter which are the case which i was discussing anjum mh gaswala and the lawyer from the taxpayer side has claimed that there was a press release which was issued by the government and their assessee has relied on that honorable supreme court in the case of it was an income tax matter honorable supreme court has told in crystal clear terms that on authorities only binding document is a circular with that to issued under section 119 the under uh, under section 119 of the income tax act because the uh, and section 119 of the income tax act and uh, 168 of the gst law are peri materia similar to kind of provisions are there with very minor changes so what the honorable supreme court said is the circular that to issued under the section 168 was is only mandatory on the officer not, nothing else please mind i am not saying that it is law that's a, that story i have already covered but even whatever is mandatory on the officer is only and only circular issued under section 119 of the income tax act not otherwise with the same analogy press release in that case also the uh, the taxpayer relied on the press uh, press release supreme court said no it's, it cannot be said to be a legal uh, entity legal value is zero for them so please mind only circular issued under section 119 is binding on the officer we will examine whether the uh, these circulars which are being commonly issued by the board here are actually circular issued in section 168 of the gst law or not we'll examine that just hold on, hold on for some time now the another point now another aspect see many a time we have seen the circulars ca- uh, comes up and circulars are maybe benevolent to the assc maybe oppressive to the assc it may be both way now first of all 
one may refer the judgment of honorable supreme court in the case of masur electrical whereby the honorable supreme court has specifically if i'm not on 20 2006 judgment is that whereby honorable supreme court has clearly said that if it is a beneficial circular beneficial means beneficial to the assc it will be having a retrospective impl uh, implementation that means if some dispute was uh, there for example under the gst law there was some dispute in let's say one of the but let's say for example a rate of any of the product that whether the rate would be 12% or 18% and circular comes up and says it is 12% so yes it will be binding from the day one not to, let's talk about the the different circular which is not which is detrimental to the interest of the taxpayer or i would say oppressive circulars let me give you an example what happened there was a confusion or i would say there are difference of opinion on the rate which is applicable on the royalty which is uh, um, or i would say the sir rate of tax on the services or services provided by the government for giving rights and mines consideration of which is being reflected in terms of royalty please mind i am not saying it is taxable but assuming it is taxable there is good reason to say that this royalty is not at all taxable but as of now i am not discussing that aspect assuming that it is the assc has taken a position and admitted that okay royalty is taxable on royalty rc is to be deposited but at what tax rate more specifically before 1st january 2019 after 1st january it was uh, the rate uh, schedule got amended there are different three rates are there and the ultimately the rate schedule got amended and uh, 18% rate, rate was specifically provided over there before that what was the rate there are a couple of advance ruling which says 5% 5% means actually the rate is the rate which is applicable on the respective goods for example there is a mining of aggregate and the tax rate on aggregate is 5% in that case the rcm uh, is to be discharged at the rate of 5% on the contrary couple of advance rulings are also says that it is 18% for a pre 31st december 2018 period now circular comes so but precise the position was settled after coming up of this notification whereby the rate of tax was specifically provided to be 18% now there is a circular which is coming on other aspect has given a passing remarks about the rate of tax which is applicable on this royalty for the period starting from 1st july 2017 to 31st december 2017 18 they said okay it was never the intention to charge the rate of a uh, charge the rate of tax on this royalty which is equivalent to the resp uh, rate applicable on respectively whether it should be 18% from the day one this is what they have mentioned in the circular now what going to happen this is a circular which is a oppressive one i would say detrimental to the interest of the assessee so in that case if it is the situation the assessee has a right the or the taxpayer has a right to get the enforcement of that kind of circular only and only on prospective let me give you another example what happened recently under the gst there is a there was a entry or rather there is a entry number 23a in the exemption notification number 12 bar 2017 which was introduced with effect from 13th october 2017 it was not part of the original notification but rather it was introduced with effect from 13th october 2017 now what happened once this exemption was there this is a exemption in relation to annuities which is to be which are being received by the concessioner for granting access to road once this uh, exemption entry was introduced immediately after that the nhi issued the circular on the basis of that particular uh, amendment 
that okay, whatever the infra projects are there in which annuities are being paid, those are exempted one. That is why NHI will not pay the GST amount to the concessionaires. This is what the circular came from the NHI side. On the same parity, Ministry of uh, Highways and Road Transportation also issue a, one of the notification on the same lines in 2018. But what happened? That is interesting. What happened in June 2020, the board came up with a circular. The board came up with a circular number 150 bar 2021. Those are Ikkis make Naya circular, which says annuity received by the contractors are not exempted, rather taxable. They said the annuities are different one which are exempted one. They explained it. So precisely for the try to understand the, what, what are the situations. What board has uh, said in that circular, number 151-2021, that annuities which are being received by the con uh, road contractors are not exempted, rather it is taxable. And what was the general understanding till now, even which can be vetted from the other government and government department documents that each and everyone was understanding that it is exempted. I'm not commenting on merits of that particular circular as of now, because recently that circular has quashed as well by the Honorable Karnataka High Court. But even otherwise, having said so, that it is not quashed. For example, my point here is uh, that one has a right to get that circular and force for the prospective period only. For the prospective period only. That is very important. And this aspect, as I have already said, Masur Electrical and the following the Masur Electrical, a very, very small judgment is there, Suchitra Components versus Union of India. Sorry, uh, Suchitra Components versus uh, Commissioner of uh, Central Excise. Please refer that. In a very beautiful manner, in a very, very small judgment, para number three is there in which Supreme Court has specifically said this. So if there is an oppressive circular, the SSE has a taxpayer has a right to get it forced prospectively only. That means if there is a circular, which is clarifies something which is oppressive in nature, which is going to change the uh, whole of the chemistry or the um, uh, whole of the game of uh, rules of the game. In that case, you can get it enforced prospectively only. So that is very important. So whenever your case is covered by some, uh, some situations, for example, recently we have received, uh, yesterday only uh, a circular has been received uh, for, the, for so many items, like uh, one of the item is, let's say ice cream, so they are coming up with some kind of uh, uh, so-called, uh, I would say, relief for the uh, taxpayer also, which have not paid the taxes correctly as per them, as per the government authority. So I would say that uh, no one can uh, say that the circular is the law. And just because circular is saying so, taxability cannot be decided. Or one more aspect in, on the circular. Recently, the, in the very same circular, which released on yesterday, they have clarified that uh, services of IVF, uh, the um, hospitals provide in the nature of IVF are exempted as well. Again, this is a beneficial circular, I would say, because at some point of time, you have, you must have heard a couple of rates were being in, uh, initiated by the department and the allegation was, no, this IVF treatment is not a healthcare services. It is uh, neither preventive nor curative, so it cannot be said to be a uh, healthcare services. That is why they are trying to, they were trying to, the department was trying to uh, charge tax on them, but somehow they have clarified. So now this is a circular, beneficial, you can use it retrospectively. So whenever you are having these kind of issues, please mind circular is not the law, but if the circular is uh, beneficial to you, please use it. Supreme Court judgments are there to protect you. Now, uh, One more aspect, which is, I think, uh, which can be very useful for us, our today's discussion or today's topic. <clears throat> what happened? Let's say you have uh, received a notice. 
you have already received a maybe show cause notice and you filed a writ petition before the high court because you think there is a matter which requires a filing of the intervention of the court you directly file the writ petition but what happens till that time there is an order has not been passed many a time it happens that you have um, you have filed the petition but no order has been filed case has not been listed or if listed it uh, could not come uh, for any hearing similarly it can happen that first appellate order has been passed and now since the department was trying to force the recovery you have filed the petition before the high court and uh, till the time you are going to dispose of uh, till the time uh, any interim order is being passed by the high court department is forcing forcing you for the payment of the taxes now what to do because the moment you are going to say to that uh, officer that see uh, i have filed the case before the high court so or maybe the high court had a couple of hearings has happened in the high court high court has heard the case on the merits but uh, uh, is it it maybe a part hurt case or maybe whatever but by whatsoever reason you you don't have any stay order as of now with you now the officer presses for the recovery and uh, only the point from their side is you since you don't have any kind of uh, uh, stay will proceed for recovery if you are not going to pay them i must suggest at this particular point of time please refer judgment of the honorable supreme court in the case of parley international limited in that case sorry it is a case of case by the bombay high court not the supreme court see what happened in the similar kind of situation when the bombay high court was uh, the case was uh, dealt by the high court though there was no order the authorities proceeded further the honorable high court came up with a clear finding that when the matter is seized before the high court and high court is hearing up th that matter it is not appropriate or correct for the authority to proceed in the matter this has been specifically held by honorable bombay high court it must be very useful Uh, for each and every one of you in fact uh, it can be used any day in fact i use this judgment at uh, any number of places now with when i am discussing this i am just recollecting see since this is a bombay high court judgment i am sure that uh, most of the people who are there on the this particular call must be from maharashtra if, um, if not maharashtra maybe couple of other near neighboring state, states so the question may come let's say someone is someone has joined from the gujarat so a question from the person or viewer from the gujarat may come that this is the order passed by the bombay high court is it having any presidential value in the gujarat before the gujarat authorities so on this count i must say please mind the law declared by the the judgment pronounced by the supreme court is law of the land this is what is specifically mentioned in the mention the constitution of india about high courts the judgments of the high court are law for their respective territory but what is the situation let's say uh, let's say a particular issue has been decided in favor of the assessee by the gujarat high court and it is decided against the assessee by the madras high court which has recently happened in case of ruled case so now what going to happen in that case gujarat authorities are supposed to follow our tax payer friendly approach that means supposed to decide the cases as per judgment of the gujarat high court and madras authorities are supposed to decide the cases as per the view taken by the madras high court what about the authorities in the other states 
the other state authorities are free to decide the case on their own before two high courts are saying are uh, taking a different view what about uh, the scenario whereby up um, there is a judgment from only one high court or maybe couple of high courts taking the same view let us say just like the same situation i am uh, referring you the name of parle industry parle uh, international whereby the bombay high court has specifically said it would not be proper for the authorities to proceed in a case whereby the, the matter is before matter is subjudice before high court so it will be binding in mumbai what about other states in my humble opinion the same analogy will be applicable in the other states as well till the time there is a contrary opinion this particular aspect has been you can say the analogy can be derived from the judgment of the honorable supreme court in the case of kusumingat so in the case of kusumingat also the same aspect has been dealt maybe if i'm not wrong para number 22 or 26 is there in which the honorable supreme court has specifically said that if the there is a judgment of the high court whether interim or a final hardly matters whether it is a interim judgment or a final judgment this will be binding this will be having a binding precedent whole uh, to all of the india subject to the condition that it is about the same law it's about the same law like law passed by the parliament which is having a all india uh, effect it's not about that the state law uh, maybe it may not be apply in a maybe state laws when the states were having a their own different different kind of state sales tax but not is what happen it is a cgst is a central law and the respect state gst laws are also the twin uh, we can say uh, twin brothers only so the same analogy will apply to them as well now see moving ahead i think i can see couple of questions are here uh moderator if you can just tell me well enik shah ji should i take the queries uh, in between or should i take it uh, at the end mr shah can you suggest me Mr. Shah, can you suggest me? Uh, should I take up uh, queries right now, or maybe at a later stage? Hanegi, you got unmuted for a couple of minutes, but now again muted. Sorry, sir. Can you please tell me? Uh, should I take up queries which are there on the um, uh, Q and A box right now, or maybe at a later stage? Yes, sir. It will be fine. Okay, should I take it right now? Yes, sir. Okay, so there is one query from uh, Jyoti Pendukar. What about a notification? Whether they are a law? Yes. Uh, see, notifications are always gazetted, and they are uh, uh, they are even presented before the Parliament for their ratification as well as a part of record. So notifications and rules are always law. But please mind, neither notification nor any rule. can go beyond what is specified or provided in the statutory provisions just like a statutory provision cannot go beyond the provisions which are there which, which are there in the constitution similarly any notification or the rule cannot go beyond what is provided in the parent act that means cgst or sgst act if they do so in that case it will be treated as a ultra virus but please mind who is going to decide who is going to decide whether it is uh, beyond the statute provisions or not it's it cannot be decided it cannot be declared uh, maybe uh, it's not open for an assessee to treat it anything as ultra virus it has to be declared by the court of law only that is high court or the supreme court that's it now next there is a query in particular i am interested in understanding rule 88b impact in case of delayed reporting of the liability for returns filed in time 
Okay. See, let's take up a very interesting principle with this particular query. Uh, what has been done by a taxpayer if he has got delay, if he, you know, if he has delayed in filing of the return. Precisely, there are some, precisely, there are some compliances which was required to be done under the statute that were delayed. But have you violated any of the provision otherwise than this delay filing? For the delay filing, you have already paid your late fees. Let me introduce you one very important principle, which is substantial, um, which is called as doctrine of substantial compliances. See, Honorable Supreme Court, in the case of Harichand Shri Gopal, has discussed this aspect in a great length. Doctrine of substantial compliances. Whenever you are given any kind of benefit or exemption, the same cannot be denied merely on the procedure lapses. Please try to understand this. It's very, very important principle. I'll link it up with the penal provisions which you were referring. But firstly, we need to understand that there are two types of provisions, two types of conditions in all those situations. Number one, conditions which are mandatory. And the another is condition which are directory or the which cannot be said to be a mandatory essence or basic essence of specific requirements. For example, transitional credit. What is mandatory requirement? You will be eligible to take credit of your stocks which are lying with you. Condition, four or five conditions were there. That is stock should be of within one year's range. That means you should have invoice of within one year. The item ultimately produced out of it or maybe sold is a not an exempted item. Tax should be there in the invoice. You should have a possession of your, the invoice. So these are the kind of main requirements. Then what happened if you are having this business, you are entitled for the credit and you are supposed to file a form or a, 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 declare it in a form which is to be prescribed. Prescribed in prescribed other rules. Now the rule prescribes, rule 117 prescribes that run one form is supposed to file. Now a person, let's take a, two or three different persons. A person has file this particular form, but there was an error in forms, but the, there was an error in form. Another there is a person whereby he has tried to file, but could not file. Now department says to both the persons that, okay, you will not be eligible for the credit. Why? Because second person could not file the form. First person filed, but wrongly filed. In my humble opinion, despite this judgment from the Honorable Supreme Court or the specific on the uh, judgments on these aspects, these both the cases can be covered by the uh, uh, this principle of doctrine of substantial compliances. That means I am complying with the basic main requirements, sub, which are substantial in nature. That means I am having a stock, yes. I am having an invoice, yes. The invoice is having a tax. Yes, I'm going to use this 
uh, goods as a raw material for a taxable product or I'm going to sell it and pay the tax to the government. It was not exempted in the earlier era as well. So these are all the substantial requirements. But it's one form is to file. This is nothing but a procedural requirement, which is a directory in nature. So the courts, the assessees need to differentiate between these two types of requirements. If some compliance was supposed to be done and could not be done or could not be done in a particular manner, so compliance, then the benefit cannot be disregarded or denied. Similarly, in case of uh, 88B, what's going to happen? Just like I said, doctrine of substantial compliance is for denial of the exemption. If you'll see about the penal provisions, penal provisions attract only and only when there is a evasion, not otherwise. This is what my opinion is. A penalty can be invoked only and only in case of when there is a evasion. Was there an evasion in that case? Answer is no. And if I talk about it specifically for the this particular provision, it is not clear whether it has a correct roots or not. Because uh, source of rule 88B is actually unknown to me. Hello. I think there is some error. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, you're audible. Audible. Yes, sir. You're audible. Hello, Jatin, sir. Uh, sir, you can unmute yourself. You're visible. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, sorry. I think it got disconnected. There's some uh, error. Okay. Uh, I think I was taking up some queries. So I discussed two different aspects. One is with regard to substantial compliances and penal provisions. One query was also there just a minute. Queries are all wiped off from my panel. I don't know, is it because of that I have re-logged in? Uh, sir, there were basically four queries. Uh, I suppose you have- a a Copy and paste on the chat box because in Q&A now I cannot see a single query now. I see. I'll, I'll copy paste all the four queries, but I presume uh, you have answered all of them. Okay, fine. Uh, I think I read two and answered two. Anyways, so uh, going ahead, I think uh, I have discussed this. Yes, uh, one or two uh, more aspect I wanted to uh, share with the, all my fellow friends. See, one very important thing which will help you in the help you in cases of uh, whenever you are dealing at a maybe tribunal level, whenever it gets notified, or maybe helpful in the before the high courts. See, now, as of now, most of the cases are like uh, my friend, which uh, Avinash must have dealt with, like uh, uh, fake invoices. That fake invoices are there. There is an allegation that you have uh, purchased from a person who is not getting, who is not existing. Or most of the cases, what happened? There is actually not no inquiry has been made by the assessing officers uh, from the supplier side. This is what a practical. Uh, this is what a reality actually. Now, whatever kind of cases are there with you, I will always advise whenever there is a third party information or reliance of the third parties act is there by the department officer. Please mind, you should always ask for a cross examination of that particular party. Recently, what happened in one of the cases I have been informed, uh, I have been, uh, I have received a notice 
that okay in so and uh, you have purchased goods from so and so person and that is a bogus person kind of thing that is why you are why uh, you please show cause to the palana officer that why the credit should not be disallowed to you and input, then the penalty should be levied and so and so now what happened what should i do on a first moment a general practice would be no you yeah, yeah, uh, and the rightly so as well that okay you are going to uh, maybe like okay go you are going to defend your position that okay no i am having an invoice uh, i bona fidely purchased the uh, goods or services whatever it is and maybe this is what goods which i received this is a goods receipt note etc etc this is what getting reflected in gstr2 etc etc these kind of the please you will take fine agree not a problem but before that when the inquiry stage is going on i must advise something that please mind whenever these kind of information or situation is there which is having some nexus to the third party always ask for the first cross examination of the information let us say you uh, you get to know from the pre show cause or show cause or the at the inquiry level that okay department is having a information from the other commissioner other uh, officer that this these parties are difficult uh, not the correct one or the bogus one or has not paid the taxes so in that case you if your case is genuine you should always ask for a cross examination of that party you should always ask the officer that i want to cross examine that officer that statement that party etc so that if they are in front of you then you can de degrade the value evidentiary value which they are of the evidence which they are going to use maybe a statement of the other party until unless it is cross examined the evidentiary value will uh, 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 is under question so the moment you have cross examined and in your examination that person said okay no i have supplied the goods then their uh, um, their uh, credential of their witness will get down to a great extent and case may mold in your favor so uh, let me uh, give you the example from a, one of the case law very famous case law kalra glue factory is a very interesting example of this from the honorable supreme court what happened in one of the cases a uh, inquiry was initiated by the uh, department and what happened the department has taken a statement of uh, their accountant the accountant name was mr makila they have uh, relied upon the statement okay that so and so uh, malpractices were there or maybe clandestine removal was there etc etc so you have not paid the taxes and department made the demand on the basis of the statement which is a account a statement of the accountant and a statement of the accountant they created the they given the show cause notice created the demand the counsel of the uh, taxpayer has asked for the cross examination of the statement which was not allowed by the officer okay no no cross examination because it is your employee only so uh now what happened matter reached up to on uh, supreme court so what happened in the supreme court so till the time matter reaches supreme court mr bakilal was no more mr bakilal got uh, died so now the observation from the supreme court was that since these statement which are relied upon in making the case are not cross examined and now it is not possible to cross examine that is why the whole case was squashed so you can understand the relevance of the cross examination how much power how much strength you can give to your case at the level of um, uh, below the uh, appellate level while asking for the cross examination in if the opportunity is given for the cross examination to use that let me tell you one more thing maybe sounds maybe may, it may sound interesting to some of the friends sitting here see whenever you are getting these kind of notice which i have just discussed and you believe that your case is bona fide one your client's case is bona fide one but department is ns3 harassing them maybe on account of that okay that fellow has not paid etc 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 now you know that that uh, officers are having power under section 70 what is that power power to summon power to summon the proper officer under this act shall have power to summon any person whose attendance he consider necessary either to give evidence or to produce a document in any inquiry and this particular 
provision is uh, section is governed by the CPC provisions as well. So my question is, can you use this section? You means taxpayer. It's very important to how to deal these particular things. Can you use this section? In my humble opinion, yes. To prove your case as bona fide, to get maximum advantage, to go to give a strength to your to your case. See what happened. Department may have summoned you. You have given your statement. You have recorded. You have got. Uh, and you have uh, basically your statement got recorded. That's fine. Now what happened? You are having because sin, see what happens whenever you are going to deal with the department. You get to know in what direction the case is going. You think the department is uh, going to make the case and they are not going to inquire from the, your suppliers. Why don't you do one thing that you write a specific letter to the, your authority, to the proper officer, to the concerned officer of the case that, okay, I have purchased goods from these, these, these persons, these, these, these firms, these are the concerned person. And if any wrongdoing is there on the, if they have not paid taxes or if they, do, uh, they are not existing, it is their fault and these, this is what their name, this is what their contact number. You call them to give a statement in front of you. That means you are writing, a taxpayer is writing a letter to the IO, to the inquiry officer, to the proper officer that you call that person. Please mind if you are writing this kind of letter to the uh, proper officer and is, if officer is not issuing the summon to that fellow, then believe me, your case is going to be very, very strong at the appellate level, at the higher appellate level. So that's very important way how you are going to give strength to your cases. Now, one more aspect, which I think uh, with that, we can, I think, uh, conclude our session. See, one thing which is very important is in any appellate level, so you should be careful while you are drafting your first appeal and second appeal whenever, or maybe when you are going to assist in writ petitions. See, relief which is to be granted by any appellate authority, by any courts, are normally remains within four corners of the prayer. You may have drafted your petition. You may have drafted your appeal in a very nice manner. You may have presented facts in a very detailed or appropriate manner, I would say. You may have taken grounds, which is very correct, supported by appropriate judgments of the relevant courts, but end of the day, Ultimately, prayer matters. Ultimately, what kind of relief you are going to seek from the appellate authority or the tribunal or maybe the court, that matters. Because, see, it is ultimately your prayer which matters the most. It is settled principle that relief cannot be granted or relief should normally not be granted beyond whatever it is, whatever is sought. So whenever you are handling your cases at uh, maybe even before the adjudication level or maybe the uh, obviously before the appellate level, first, second or the before court, make sure that you are, your prayers are very comprehensive. It covers each and every aspect which you are which you uh, want the appellate authority to decide maybe in your favor on the basis of this. So all these uh, prayers should be very, very important. I think uh, I can, I should close this session because it was a very, very general session. Only that uh, litigation in absence of uh, tribunal. So once again, just to summarize that if there is no tribunal, there is a order by which you can wait and watch. Once again, that the, your time limit of 90 days for filing of the tribunal appeal will start from the date of its uh, functioning of the tribunal. Secondly, you can just uh, pre-deposit maybe 20% uh, of the amount of the disputed tax amount and uh, uh, can so seek uh, relief 
from the uh, seal can relieve from the authority itself not to recover the amount. And lastly, in appropriate cases, whereby like uh, you believe that the, you are not going to get relief from the terminals, I think you can, that those will be the cases which will be having good, uh, good directly go to the high court, irrespective of the stage, whether it is a first blood or order is passed, or maybe adjudication order is passed, or maybe it is only at a show cause level or at a other uh, inquiry level, which I, for which I have discussed, which I have discussed in detail earlier. With this, I conclude my session. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts with all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for your words and your knowledge. Uh, we'll take up the questions. If uh, anybody has any questions, you can uh, type it down. It was a very generalized session, no question by anyone. <laughs> Nevertheless, I take this opportunity to propose a well-deserved vote of thanks uh, to Jatin sir for this in-depth knowledge, uh, intriguing, as well as the use of those uh, case laws, the mentioning of those case laws, which are which I suppose majority of the participants would be at least reading, if not uh, using in the times to come to gain their profit, to uh, sharpen their professional skills. So with this, uh, I propose a very deserved vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. And uh, have a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello. 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 Hello.